Hi, I'm Marco Werman. Over the past several months, we have all experienced how an event in a corner of China has overwhelmed and reshaped our lives. As I speak, COVID-19 continues to spread through virtually every country on Earth. We began reporting on the coronavirus in January, and our content is freely available to everyone. None of our coverage has ever been behind a paywall. Global reporting is expensive to create, which is why we are asking for your support during this brief appeal. We're grateful when you listen to public radio and especially grateful for supporting the journalism of the world in this moment. Please go to theworld.org slash give and contribute or follow the link right here in the episode notes. That's theworld.org slash give. Be safe, be healthy, and thank you. Stop fighting on the battlefield, pivot to fighting the pandemic. That's what world leaders are calling for. It is time to put armed conflict on lockdown and focus together on the true fight of our lives. Today on The World, who's paying attention to those appeals? I'm Marco Werman. More and more of the globe is on lockdown. That means it's getting harder for families to put food on the table. It's a dilemma for Nigeria. But then again, we are Nigerians. There is no level of hardship Nigerians cannot overcome. I mean, we've seen it all. We'll get through this. We'll get past it. And when your job is zookeeper, lockdown can mean you're quarantined with the animals. I can look out of my window and I get woken up by flamingos. (laughs) We are literally in the middle of the park. Those stories and more today here on The World. It's going to get worse before it gets better. That is the message today from the White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator. Dr. Deborah Burks gave a prediction of what could happen in the coming months. If we do things together well, almost perfectly, we could get in the range of 100,000 to 200,000 fatalities. 100 to 200,000 fatalities. That's if this country does things right. With medical equipment in short supply, hospitals in Italy have already had to ration care. And now doctors in New York are planning out how to treat patients in overcapacity ICUs with limited equipment. This issue of how to ration scarce medical resources is the subject of an article in the New England Journal of Medicine. Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel is one of the authors. He was a health policy advisor to President Obama and teaches medical ethics at the University of Pennsylvania. So shortages of masks, tests, and potentially even beds and ventilators. What are some of the pressures that came to bear in a place like Italy with rationing, and what were some of the choices that had to be made there? Well, they had exactly the choices you were talking about. They had not enough ICU beds for all the patients who needed it. They did not have enough ventilators in certain places. You know, doctors are having to choose which patients get on and which patients don't. So to put this in plain English, it might mean a doctor would have to choose between an elderly patient who doesn't have that many more years to live and a younger patient, correct? Well, you may have to choose between two older patients or two younger patients. Depends how bad the shortages are and which patients you're being confronted at your facility. Uh, These are all tragic choices. There are no good, simple options. It's not like you can put your head in the sand and, oh, this shortage is going to pass. Part of the issue is that the shortage won't pass and you are forced by nature, uh, not because you want to, but by nature, uh, to make a choice. And uh, this is one of the most serious, uh, wrenching vaccine choices that doctors and nurses have to make. And, uh, you know, you've seen reports of people actually crumbling under the pressure because no one wants to make it. You go into the medical profession to heal, to care for people. And this is one where you can't care for someone and you feel powerless and, uh, People are worried about burnout and PTSD because of these kind of choices. It's really, really tragic. Yeah, and in your New England Journal of Medicine article, you and your co-authors outline four fundamental values that might apply to making these gut-wrenching choices. Um, what are they, quickly? Well, quickly, there you want to maximize the benefit. That's the most important thing, both in terms of life saved and in terms of life years or prognosis. You want to, you know, realize equality when you have patients that are roughly equal in prognosis. You want to actually 
do some random selection. Uh, you want to recognize social usefulness. Doctors, nurses, other frontline first responders, they have to get priority to continue doing their job. Um, and you want to give priority to the worst off. In this case, the worst off are the youngest who will die without having an opportunity to live a full life. I ought to say one other thing. These priority decisions are not just for COVID patients. They have to apply for all patients. If you happen to have a heart attack or a stroke or cancer, you should get priority just as equal to a COVID-19 patient. So it's really all patients who need healthcare resources have to be considered at the same time. And that makes these choices even more complicated uh, than just choosing between one COVID patient and another COVID patient. Medical ethicist Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel is a vice provost at the University of Pennsylvania. He's got a new series on MSNBC starting tonight called Life in a Time of Coronavirus. Dr. Emanuel, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for being here, Marco, and thanks for raising this incredibly tough issue that we're all going to have to think about. It's time to put down your guns because, well, because of the coronavirus. That's the appeal coming from world leaders over the past few days. They're pleading with warring sides in several major conflicts across the world, asking them to stop the fighting so healthcare professionals and aid groups can deal with this deadly pandemic. But are those calls being heard? The world's Shirin Jafari reports. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres made this plea last week. The coronavirus, he said, illustrates the folly of war. I am calling for an immediate global ceasefire in all corners of the world. The Arab League is also calling for an immediate ceasefire. It's an organization made up of 22 Arab nations across the Middle East and North Africa. Hossan Zaki is its assistant secretary general. Give peace a chance. Halt all military activities, hostile activities and start giving people a break. Zaki is calling upon armed groups around the world to do what most of us are doing, hunker down, wash their hands, and cover their mouths when they cough. The coronavirus has now reached most major conflict areas in the world. Syria has reported cases, so has Afghanistan and Libya. Yemen has yet to report any infections, but it's likely just a matter of time. Zeki says years of fighting has decimated the healthcare systems in these countries. The suffering of the peoples in those countries is already so immense because of the ongoing uh, wars. And then the pandemic comes and then the suffering becomes just unimaginable. In Syria, a humanitarian group called the White Helmets has dispatched teams to disinfect schools, mosques and other public facilities. They also hand out leaflets that teach Syrians in displacement camps how to properly wash their hands. So far, a ceasefire in northern Syria is holding, but that's only part of the story. Ayman Al-Timimi researches jihadi groups. He says the idea that the Islamic State and others in Syria are dead is simply not true. Tamimi says the Islamic State sees a few opportunities in this pandemic. One of the things IS has called for, actually, in this context is uh, renewed efforts to try to break free prisoners held, say, in camps in eastern Syria and elsewhere. On Sunday, a group of ISIS prisoners managed to escape from a prison in northern Syria. Some of them were recaptured, but others are still on the loose. Vera Mironova, a researcher at Harvard University, connected me with one of the fighters in Idlib province. He's originally from Uzbekistan and calls himself Abu Shweib. He's with a jihadist group called Liwa Muhajirin Ansar. In an audio message, Abu Shweib tells me he's not worried about the coronavirus pandemic. People here are wearing masks and gloves to protect themselves, he says. So I asked him about the calls for a ceasefire. Will he and his fellow fighters stop their attacks so that locals can deal with the coronavirus outbreak? It's the Russian and Syrian forces that are attacking civilians. They're the ones who don't care about human lives, he says. The Islamic State is active in Afghanistan as well. Last week, it carried out an attack on a Sikh temple in Kabul, killing 25 people. 
In the aftermath, families gathered to mourn their loved ones. <laughs> Then there's the Taliban. The group recently signed an agreement with the U.S. that raised hopes for a final peace deal with the Afghan government. But just over the weekend, the Taliban fighters carried out a series of attacks in Afghanistan. The group begins its annual spring offensive this week. In a text message exchanged with Sohel Shaheen, a Taliban spokesman, I ask about the new calls for a ceasefire. He never responds. So far, it seems the pleas from the United Nations and others are not being heard. In Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, and elsewhere, fighters don't see a bigger common threat in the coronavirus, and they're not ready to swap their guns for hand sanitizers and surgical masks. For the world, I'm Shirin Jafari. Even if wars are not grinding to a halt amid the global COVID-19 pandemic, something else is. Refugee resettlement. The pause on the global relocation of refugees is leaving families divided and people stranded thousands of miles from each other. The world's Rupa Shinoy reports. In Ohio, a couple separated from their baby finally thought they were going to be reunited. <laughs> Damon Abshir told me the story in Somali through an interpreter. Four years ago, she and her husband, Muhammad, were living in a refugee camp in Ethiopia when they finally got approval to be resettled in the United States. Mohammed was sick and needed medical treatment. So rather than delay to get their newborn baby daughter Nimco's paperwork in order, They left her behind with her grandmother. They've been fighting to bring Nimco to Ohio ever since. A few weeks ago, everything seemed to finally be in order for Nimco to join her parents. Then the coronavirus hit. <laughs> Abshir doesn't know when she'll see Nimco again and can only hope it'll be soon. Because of COVID-19, the United Nations International Organization for Migration has put refugee resettlements on hold, quote, for as long as it remains essential. Advocates say that's left Abshir's family and thousands of other refugees worldwide in limbo. Yael Schaefer is senior U.S. advocate for Refugee International. They're refugees who are survivors of violence or torture. They're unsafe where they're living. These are sort of the people who really, really do need to be resettled. They need to be gotten out of there. Canada is the current world leader in resettlement. It expected to welcome about 30,000 refugees this year. Shauna Labman is an associate professor of human rights at the Global College University of Winnipeg. She says it's hard to know how people in the pipeline will be affected by the current stop in resettlements. Because it's really hard to know how long this will actually continue. The likelihood is it'll slow down everything, of course. That means families stay separated longer because many people in the process of coming to Canada are joining relatives who've already settled there. So I'm sure a lot of people are left feeling extremely fearful in these moments. There's a lot of precarity at play right now. At the International Rescue Committee, Jennifer Syme worries some will see the suspension in refugee resettlements as confirmation of the unfounded fear that foreigners are bringing COVID-19. I mean, we're already seeing here in the United States attacks against Asian Americans just because of the coronavirus. She says refugees approved for resettlement have gone through extensive health and security checks. Officials are actually worried they'll be exposed and infected while traveling. What's important is to ensure that this pause in the resettlement program due to COVID-19 doesn't become permanent and that this is not used as an excuse for stopping the resettlement program even at a time when COVID-19 is no longer an issue. Until the program resumes, Damon Epshear says she and her husband in Ohio can do nothing but pray. They've just had another baby, a little boy, who they can't wait to introduce to his big sister. But they worry that back in Ethiopia, their daughter Nimco could be in danger. With little access to water and other basic services, advocates warn refugee camps could soon be hot spots for COVID-19. Abshir says for now, Nimco's life is in God's hands. For The World, I'm Rupa Shinoy. Coming up on the show, one of those nature breaks you need for your mental health. And thanks to the magic of radio, you can actually stay indoors. You're with The World. 
Hello, public media fans. We know you value what we do here at The World, but it costs a lot of money to bring you these important stories. Important stories with context and critical voices from the front lines in our interconnected world. That's why we are asking for your support during our spring campaign. These days, more than ever, independent journalism is an important part of our democracy. We're asking you to help support it now. Go to theworld.org slash give. Become a monthly supporter of the program that informs, educates, and connects you with our changing world. That's theworld.org slash give. Stay safe, stay healthy, and thank you. I'm Marco Werman. You're with The World. If you think you're feeling cooped up at home, try sharing your space with over 1,000 wild animals. Penguins, red pandas, parrots, otters, to name just a few. That's the situation Izzy Wheatley finds herself in now. She's a zookeeper at Paradise Park in Cornwall, England. The zoo is closed to the public during the coronavirus lockdown, but Wheatley and three of her colleagues are living there so they can continue taking care of the animals. We decided to move in um, basically because we have our families at home who we didn't want to, you know, spread the virus to if we so happen to catch it from anyone at work. But the main part was just so we could stay on site. So even if it all else, you know, fails and none of the other zookeepers can come in, us four can hopefully hold down the ship. And when we say move in, how close are you now to the animals? I can look out of my window and I get woken up by flamingos. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Perfect. We are literally in the middle of the park. We are surrounded by birds. What does a typical day look like for you now? We're just keeping separate all the time, which is making some of the um, tasks a little more more difficult. As you can imagine, it's quite a teamwork job. So at the moment, we've got some Abyssinian ground hornbills who have actually just laid an egg today. And so as soon as they lay an egg, they become very, very aggressive. Mm. Um, If you don't know what they are, they are like very big ground birds, but they can fly. Um, They have huge, long beaks and they bash their beaks. So we have to go in with almost like a riot shield to make sure um, we can block off the door while the other one goes in to feed. Because one person at a time, there's you. it's not very safe. I'll take note to next time I see an Abyssinian hornbill nesting in the wild. <laughs> not Just to go run close. away. <laughs> <laughs> and so you and the other three, you must, I mean, you're maintaining social distance at all time during the day, I suspect. Yeah, we are trying our best to. Um, and especially while we're living together now, it is, we're, we've got to now do it in the flat. Um, together, we are mainly concerned about keeping our distance, especially from the other keepers who are coming in and out, because we're not actually leaving the park at the moment, mm. um, which is completely crazy. Um, so I've never stayed at work so long in my life. It, it, <laughs> is that is that what's the most crazy part of it that you've just you're just there twenty four seven now? Yeah, we are just at work twenty four seven. There's no switch off mode anymore, and there can't really be because there's all of this extra work. We, we're constantly changing rotors. We're constantly updating what jobs need to be done, and also we've just hit breeding season, so it's completely crazy. Everything has just started breeding, so we're going to be updating wow. all of the chick diets. There is just so much going on at the work. There's not really a break when you get home. So, does that mean when the animals start giving birth? I mean, will you need biological specialists to come in, or are you some of you qualified to do that? Most of it is birds and they are quite good. However, we have been hand rearing penguins the last couple of years because our parents don't seem to be the best at it. I can imagine within the next couple of weeks, we are going to have some baby penguins in the flat, which we are hand rearing. (laughs) Are you looking forward to that or a little (laughs) little bit of trepidation there? We're we're keeping our fingers crossed that the penguins will be good parents this year and we don't have to hand rear any and we can just let them do their business and we can have a good night's sleep. (laughs) I mean, I've got these images of that book, Mr. Popper's Penguins, in my head and you're like in that (laughs) room there and little baby penguins wandering around. But it does raise a kind of point. I'm wondering about coronavirus in a zoo. Have you checked in with biologists or epidemiologists to find out, like, is there any risk of transmission from animal species to humans or vice versa? We've had to just assume from the guidelines that have been given out, we, there are no definites for yes and no, as far as we're aware, um, for zoos. But we're keeping, you know, Oz on top of it as we can. And we are taking all the precautions we, we can with gloves, washing hands, keeping our distance and not having the contact unless it's necessary. Izzy Wheatley, a zookeeper at Paradise Park in Cornwall, England, currently one of four zookeepers on the site. Izzy, thanks very much and stay strong through this. Thank you very much.
Wellness gurus do recommend you get out to connect with nature when possible. That can be hard if you live in a city and the path toward nature is crowded with other humans. If that's the case, consider this next story, your moment of nature zen for today. Recently, the annual European Tree of the Year was named. It's an award meant to highlight the way people connect emotionally with nature. This year's winner was a pine tree in the Czech Republic known as the Guardian of the Flooded Village. Miroslav Kondrata from the Czech Environmental Partnership in Brno told me about the winner. The winner is 350 years old pine tree, which is on the rock above the uh, lake, which was built in the 50s. And the tree is the only lively remain of the village of Chudobin, which was flooded by this lake uh, back in the 50s. So there is, there is a, a story, and, and it also shows how deep are the roots of the locals to their community. So the locals are not just proud, though, of this tree. I mean, there's a lot of folklore around this little pine as well. How does it fit into local legends? Often, you know, people going around uh, can hear uh, the whistling wind in, in the the needles uh, of the pine tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the needles on, on the pine, so, so they they connected it with the with the devil's uh, sound. So that that's that's just the uh, you know the the legend around every tree. We had in the former years, for instance, the winner of the year of 2017 was the Polish so-called Joseph Oak, and this in this tree, the Jewish family was hidden for a couple of months, uh, you know, during the Nazi period. So this big story also brought the first place in, in the European contest to this Polish oak. So it seems like the idea of the Tree of the Year Award is that if people connect with the natural world, they may be more likely to want to protect it. Are you seeing the results of that in the Czech Republic? Are trees and the environment more valued today than they were 10 years ago? Yes. Also, in the official polls, we observe much closer relation to the nature, much bigger awareness of the climate change and how the trees are important for climate adaptations, uh, not only in the nature, but also in the, in the cities and near our homes. Miroslav, as you know, a lot of people are confined to their homes right now with the coronavirus. What are your concerns about so many people being disconnected from nature or are you hopeful that maybe people are connecting with nature now in maybe a different way? There is a lot of people, you know, driving and going for the walk to the, to the forest. It's one of few activities they can do. We observe also growing interest in uh, gardening, for instance. Uh, I think people will be more aware of say, self-sustainability. We, we will observe greater interest for growing their food and fruit and and vegetables, uh, which is good, I think. Uh, I think the world will will change uh, after this coronavirus and people will be more aware of many, many things. Well, Miroslav Kondrata from the Czech Environmental Partnership Foundation, thank you for telling us about the guardian of the flooded village. Thank you very much for inviting me. News headlines are coming up in about a minute. You're with the world. Plays, operas, comedy shows, and concerts, they're all moving online. I'm Marco Werman. A virtual festival is putting the social in social distancing. Even if that dancer is in Tanzania or that artist is in the UK, we are part of the same community. There's even a beer tent. Soon, here on The World. Mixed messages. That's what millions of Russians are getting from their government on COVID-19. It started last week with a presidential address from Vladimir Putin. Putin announced that this week would be a holiday week with paid time off, but he did not mention social distancing or a quarantine. That was last week, as I said, and so much has changed since then. Moscow's mayor and the prime minister have called for social isolation. Still, until today, Putin remains silent. Now Moscow is suddenly under quarantine. Reporter Charles Maines is in the city. I asked him if this quarantine order came as a surprise. 
Well, I think it was. Putin, as you noted, addressed the nation last week, calling for a workless week that was to be paid by the government. The thing is that Putin, while he urged people to stay home, it was a far cry from a quarantine, and people seemed to take it that way. You know, there were people out in the parks over the weekend. There were a lot of people barbecuing because it was nice weather. And all of this mm -hmm. uh, didn't please Moscow Mayor Sergei Sabyanin. He said this was not the desired effect, and so he issued the quarantine. Now, what does that mean for now? It means Muscovites can only go out to supermarkets, to pharmacies, uh, walk the dog, maybe take out the trash. And that's not if you're already under quarantine, which I am, uh, because I arrived from a hotspot, the U.S., uh, just a few weeks ago. Mm. And how is that going to be enforced? Well, they're saying right now that they will issue permits for some people, essential workers, to get around the city. They've also talked about these QR codes, essentially barcodes. Uh, they'll be issued through the mayor's office, which would allow police to quickly check uh, where you're registered, how you're getting around. So it's a way to sort of provide some social controls. And, of course, there are issues there with surveillance. So Vladimir Putin seemed to suggest that this wasn't a big deal in Russia. Did he have an about face on all this? You know, it did. And even his speech just last week was calling for, again, this workless week. It seemed to a lot of people to be a questionable choice. Uh, today, he took to the airways again. This time, he said, we've got to save lives. And he endorsed the quarantine. Now, the problem is that if you talk to medical professionals, there are a lot of concerns, of course. But underreporting of cases, Russia has now just 1,800 cases confirmed, uh, nine deaths. And a lot of people are certainly concerned that that reflects some kind of uh, artificial lowballing. Yeah, I mean, there was concern that that low number of cases uh, suddenly in the middle of it, there is a suspicious spike of pneumonia cases. So how much can we trust Russia's reported numbers? The critics say that these numbers are low. There's uh, questions about ineffective testing, also reclassifying these illnesses as something like pneumonia instead of COVID-19. I talked to a neurosurgeon in Moscow named Dr. Selovod Shurkhai, and he had concerns that even with the low statistics as is, uh, Russia is already having problems being prepared. According to the official position of the Moscow government and Russian government in general, we don't have any epidemic in Russia, but we already don't have any resources to prepare for it. So my question is, guys, what did you do for almost two months? Almost nothing at all. Charles, do you think other medical professionals would agree with him? Well, we're hearing from some, primarily on state media. As I said, you know, if state media shows these well-equipped hospitals, Putin just last week, in fact, visited one in Moscow that looked nice. But on social media, it tells a different story. You know, there's shortages of masks, protective suits, ventilators, and the hospitals in the regions are certainly desperately underfunded compared to Moscow. So I think there's a real worry here that the entire healthcare system will be tested uh, beyond what capacity as this uh, virus unfolds. Reporter Charles Maines in Moscow telling us about Russia's response to COVID-19. Charles, thanks very much. Thank you. From lockdown in Russia to lockdown in Nigeria, major cities in Africa's most populous nation are shuttered after authorities identified more than 100 cases of COVID-19. The country's borders are closed, domestic flights are grounded, and the price of Nigeria's main export, oil, has plummeted. I asked journalist and author Adobe Trisha Wobani in Abuja what people are saying about the outbreak in Nigeria's capital. For now, we have just the top government, really top government officials, people like the president, President Buhari's right-hand man, and then top politicians, former vice president, son, head of customs and immigration, these people who can afford to fly in and fly out. In fact, I was listening to the news a short while ago, and a government official was saying, it's wrong for you people to keep thinking it's a disease for the rich people. Please be careful. Please observe social distances. We are dreading what would happen if it trickled down from the top. The elites have their houses, have their cars. Now imagine if it gets to the masses who live in these crowded, overpopulated slums. We cannot even imagine the kind of disaster awaiting us. And that is why the lockdown is so essential at this time. Well, help us think through that, because there are so many people in Lagos. Uh, I think of the young men striving to make a living, the so-called area boys. Uh, I mean, exactly. they're outside almost all the time. Where yes. could they actually self-isolate? There are people who depend on their having to leave their houses every day to eat a meal for that day. So there are millions of people like that in this country, in cities like Lagos. There are people who live dozens in a room with no electricity. They have to move around all day to be, you know, to feel alive, to be healthy. So we just can't imagine what it would be like trying to keep these people cooped up. 
The Ebola crisis in 2014 was taken very seriously in Nigeria. The WHO called Nigeria's work tracing potential Ebola contacts world-class epidemiological detective work. Today, though, we're hearing about kind of the rumor mill taking over where science seemed to rule in 2014, everything from a deep belief in the curative powers of chloroquine, the malaria prevention drug, to how coronavirus even came to Nigeria in the first place. What's going on and what have been the lessons from Ebola in 2014? Well, Nigeria definitely handled Ebola well. We had some really qualified, exemplary health professionals at the forefront of that battle. After the Ebola crisis, the people at the forefront, those of them who didn't die, were not paid. They were praised all over the world, but till today, they're struggling to get the fees they're owed. And so a lot of them left their jobs. Some that I know returned to the United Kingdom, returned to the United States. You know, these were returnees, Nigerian, qualified Nigerian uh, medical personnel who returned to help their country. So yes, Nigeria was praised at that time, but I believe that we're having to raise a new team to tackle this. So we're sort of starting from scratch to tackle this epidemic. Meantime, the price of Nigeria's main export oil is in free fall, Adobe. I mean, so much of the remaining economy in Nigeria is informal. So can Nigerians comply with the lockdown and still put food on the table? We dread the next two weeks. But then again, we are Nigerians. You know, like Fela said in one of his popular songs, the popular musician Fela, Mm. uh, late musician, said, suffering and smiling. We also know that there is no level of hardship Nigerians cannot overcome. I mean, we've seen it all. We know that anyhow, anyhow, we'll get through this, we'll get past it. Fela Anikulapokuti, always quotable, now more than ever. Journalist and author Adobe Trisha Wobani in Nigeria's capital. and smiling. The coronavirus is nothing to smile about. At least the daily press briefings from the World Health Organization keep us informed. Here's Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, the head and central figure at the WHO. WHO continues to call on all countries to implement a comprehensive approach with the aim of flattening the curve. The WHO's authority to manage global health emergencies has grown over the years, but there are still significant limits on what it can do. The world's Alana Gordon has a story about how its power has evolved. The global health stage is crowded with all sorts of performers, individual governments, NGOs, private companies. And on that stage, the World Health Organization has a unique role. Think of it as the conductor of a symphony. It would be a discordant symphony at the start, trying to get people to work together. David Heyman is an infectious disease specialist at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He has held many posts in the WHO and been on the front lines of confronting outbreaks from smallpox to Ebola. And when things are working smoothly, then again, it's more like, um, well, water music would be a good one by Handel. The WHO was founded after World War II. Nations believed that they should work together to avoid another world war and to help prevent the spread of diseases. Serious epidemics like cholera had already proven the need for international cooperation. To understand just what the WHO can do, it's important to understand how it's set up. It has representatives from 194 countries who meet annually to set international health policies and directives and even pass legally binding global regulations. There's one catch, though. The WHO can't really enforce the rules it sets. It is a conductor of an orchestra which doesn't have any authoritative tools. That is Mary Paul Kinney, a former assistant director of the WHO, who now oversees research at France's National Institute of Health. So if an instrument is playing well or badly, there's nothing you can do. This dynamic has been a challenge for the WHO from the get-go. So over the decades, it's developed a set of tools to nudge nations to act in harmony, to follow the same musical score, if you will. David Heyman says the aim was narrow at first, to help communities address just a few kinds of infectious diseases. The essence of a successful smallpox campaign is to quickly find outbreaks of the disease and contain them. 
But a problem cropped up. It was clear that you could not force countries to report, and they didn't want to report. Countries didn't always want to report an outbreak of a disease because it could make them vulnerable to trade sanctions or to outside groups who might use them to make medical discoveries that they then wouldn't share. So the WHO made some changes. It set up a global network of labs and disease specialists that could respond to outbreaks in a coordinated way. And it stopped relying solely on self-reported information from countries. Heyman was on the front lines of these efforts in the early 2000s when this revamped system was put to the test. It had already picked up an outbreak of a disease which was causing high mortality in China in November of 2002. But China continued to reply that they did not have any major outbreaks. That major outbreak became known as Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS. The hearing on Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, SARS. Um, we have to be prepared for this to continue to spread, and we are doing everything we can across the public health system. Experts agree that the SARS crisis worsened because of China's secrecy. So global representatives granted the WHO even more governing power. Now, the WHO can declare a health emergency of international concern even if a country denies it's suffering an outbreak. This declaration can trigger a global response, an activation of resources, and more feet on the ground. It's an incredibly powerful responsibility that WHO has. Suri Moon is co-director of the Global Health Center at the Graduate Institute of Geneva. The world really relies on the judgment when it's assessing you know, any particular outbreak as to how serious is it? How much does the world need to wake up and mobilize a a more coordinated international response? With this new ability, the WHO can issue guidelines and protocols on how to best respond to a health emergency. The WHO has also been granted stronger diplomatic power. It can officially call out countries that aren't following the rules. Thomas Boyke is director of the Global Health Program at the Council on Foreign Relations, and he's been a technical advisor to the WHO. The World Health Organization has the authority to name and shame nations that aren't complying with the requirements on reporting outbreaks or in not enforcing human rights in the way that they go about restricting pandemics. And name and shame they did. In the aftermath of the SARS crisis, the WHO publicly called out China for hiding the outbreak. That was a big deal. David Heyman was overseeing communicable diseases at the WHO at the time, and he recalls a shift. China started sharing information and better preparing for a future outbreak. So the norm has been changed. It's now expected and respected to report. All of these developments might seem great, but the WHO still can't make countries comply with its rules. And it doesn't always make the right call when a crisis hits. It was heavily criticized for not acting soon enough when the Ebola outbreak swept through West Africa in 2014. Contagious and potentially deadly. Killing more than 10,000 people. This prompted the WHO to take even greater action to better prepare for the next global health emergency. Which brings us to today. The WHO is now leading the world's response to a new pandemic. One that is bringing even the best health systems to near collapse. There are really troubling signs that countries are fighting selfishly for their own national interests. But some health experts say that if nothing else, the WHO is doing well at getting scientists and public health leaders to coordinate their work worldwide. And it's happening at a scale and speed that's unprecedented. WHO Director Dr. Tedros Adnan Ghebreyesus calls this pandemic the defining global health crisis of our time. The days weeks and months ahead will be a test of our resolve, a test of our trust in science, and a test of solidarity. It may only be after this pandemic ends that we'll know how well the world did in this test of resolve and solidarity. But for now, the WHO keeps waving its baton higher and higher to try to get everyone on the same page and playing the same song. For the world... I'm Alana Gordon. Art is meant to be shared, whether at a concert, in a museum, or at the theater, which is near impossible under social distancing guidelines, except at one new festival— 
The world's Bianca Hillier reports. The band Ukoikoi has been preparing to release their first EP in Johannesburg, South Africa. Musicians Analyzer and Yogan Sullivan were to perform their self-titled single at a major festival this past weekend. Analyzer said the gig was a really exciting opportunity for exposure in Johannesburg. Our own African Hollywood, you know, so this was going to be like a big break. But it didn't happen. The festival got canceled because of COVID-19. And Yogan said it wasn't their only canceled gig. All of the places as an artist where you have your incomes coming in from, All of them are just being cut. Then they found out about one festival that was still on, the Social Distancing Festival. The Social Distancing Festival is one of these platforms and opportunities that we are so glad to be part of. The Social Distancing Festival is an online space for artists to showcase their work if a performance or exhibition has been shut down by the coronavirus. Toronto-based playwright Nick Green created the virtual festival after his own production was cancelled during the second week of rehearsal. The response to the project was immediate. Four days later, on one day, it received something like 75,000 unique visitors. Since then, content has come in from around the globe. Danya Alkuli is a poet from Syria. For the past two years, she's been working on her latest book called Contortionist Tongue which talks about what it's like to be a Syrian woman in today's socio-political climate. Whether it's through relationships or through navigating through sexism or just trying to find your place, finding out what's home. Al-Khuli's book launch was scheduled for March 14th, but the day before, the venue called and said they were shutting down. I was very panicked the day of receiving that message and, you know, was not expecting that. Initially, Al-Khuli didn't have a backup plan. Then people started asking her to do a virtual book launch. She decided to go for it and hopped on Facebook Live with her poetry cat. Disclaimer, it's actually a lot more nerve-wracking to do a virtual uh, release than it is to do in person. There is a poetry cat that could be joining us, um, my cat Kai. The virtual book launch made its way onto the Social Distancing Festival site, where it sits alongside pieces from artists with a range of backgrounds, now on the same playing field. From high school performances of The Wizard of Oz in Virginia... Performances from the Dutch National Opera Studio. (laughs) Rosemary Joshua is the head of the opera studio. She said the world premiere of their opera, Ritrato, was canceled just one day before opening night. So the cast recorded a dress rehearsal and submitted it to the Social Distancing Festival. This was incredibly uplifting for the young singers to at least have a record for posterity that they could share at least all their hard work, even though it was a dress rehearsal. Keeping a record of the art being produced during the pandemic is important, says Scottish artist Andrew McNiven, who is featured on the site for his moving image project called Bachelors. It provides an archive. It's a, it's a kind of slice through a particular period of time or through a particular event. And as such, I think it will become more valuable as time goes on. As time goes on, creator Nick Green isn't sure what the social distancing festival will become. In just two weeks, he's received hundreds of submissions, gathered eight volunteers to keep it all running, and dreamt up a fantasy scenario for how the site could connect artists. My dream is to hear the story of two artists that have met through my site and collaborate on some really profound piece of art and they live across the world and never would have met otherwise. Green says his dream could come to fruition in the site's beer tent, which actually exists just like at any proper festival, though it's really just a chat room for artists to connect. And that, Green says, was the goal of the social distancing festival all along. Even if that dancer is in Tanzania or that artist is in the UK, we are part of the same community. And that's really, really kept me company at a time that otherwise would have been devastatingly lonely, I think. Who knew it would take a little social distancing to bring us all closer together? For The World, I'm Bianca Hillier. To check out featured artists with the Social Distancing Festival, go to theworld.org. A lot of people have been communicating with each other online through music. 
jamming together or playing a part, then mixing the different parts to create a song. That, by the way, is the essence of improvisation, call and response. It's a feature of music all over the globe, definitely for these players. died two years ago. The album is called Rejoice, and it couldn't have come at a better time because A, it is joyous, and B, it comes with great advice from Tony Allen on how to start improvising via long distance. I think it's a question of, okay, let's do something together. Right. Very basic question there. And Allen says it goes on from there. Okay, I'm going to be creating my patterns, which is going to be different patterns. And every pattern... He has to relate to my patterns to, to write his melodies, you know? And um, that was it. Setting up a drum pattern, letting the melody maker, Hugh Masekela, create his own pattern in response. You know what? Let the music speak for itself. Tony Allen, give us a beat. New music from Tony Allen and late trumpeter Hugh Masekela. More sounds to soothe the savage isolation. That is the world on this Monday. We come to you from the Nan and Bill Harris studio at WGBH in Boston. Until tomorrow, stay safe, stay smart, stay strong. The World is a co-production of WGBH Boston, the BBC World Service, and PRX. PRX.